Welcome to Hope Community Church, 4th of July edition. I am not Steve Treichler. Steve is actually in Boston. He's doing a wedding for his, uh, his niece. He was on a boat this afternoon, marrying them off. And so uh, I get the opportunity. My name is Bart Carey. I'm an elder here at Hope, and I get the honor to uh, preach, with, uh, preach to you guys tonight. But before we get started, I want to start with a history quiz. How many history buffs do we have in here? I know Jordan's one. Did I, you? No? Thought it. Oh, well, this isn't going to be any fun. <laughs> Go to the next slide. What's, what document is this? Declaration of Independence. Does anyone know it when it was signed? What? July 2nd? That's really close. No? Nope. August 2nd. It was enacted on July 4th. The, the Congress at that time agreed to it, um, but it, uh, it was actually signed on August 2nd. Do you know who wrote it? Thomas Jefferson. Do you know who else contributed to writing it? Benjamin Franklin. What was that? I have to check. What did you say? Nope. John Adams from Massachusetts, Roger Sherman, Benjamin Franklin, Robert R. Livingston from New York, and Thomas Jefferson from Virginia. Um, Actually, Robert R. Livingston never agreed to it. He helped write it, but he never agreed to it. He was from New York, and he actually wanted to make peace with Britain instead of fight. Um, But I like what Jefferson said. Um, A quote from Jefferson, this sounds a lot like his... uh, his senior project in college, because here's what he said. The other members of the community unanimously pressed on myself alone to undertake the draft, so I consented. It sounds a lot like my senior project. but uh. This is a picture of the back of the Declaration of Independence. There is no map. There's no special codes, not even with the special cool glasses. There's no map there. That's a picture of it. Um, And another interesting fact, 50 years to the day from uh, July 4th, 1776, um, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died. 50 years to the day. That's kind of interesting. Enough for the history quiz. We're talking about the redeemed life set free, the pursuit of holiness. And uh, we're using Hebrews 12, 14, Steve's special translation for this uh, study. Pursue hard, or pursue hard, or strive after peace with everyone, and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. We're using uh, uh, Jerry Bridges' uh, book, Pursuit of Holiness, to kind of lead us through this in this first few weeks. Um, and Steve I just uh, talked about the battle for holiness. So last week he covered, um, this was kind of his closing section. I want to I start here because it kind of ties in with where we're going. But count yourselves dead to sin. That's r- from Romans 6.11. And then don't let sin reign. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. And then the last one, uh, the last step is offer yourselves to God. This is the battle for holiness. The last time I preached, it was actually in the gospel series, um, and um, if any of you remember that, um, I, I preached on Colossians 2, 6, and it was, I, I talked a lot about this uh, patient persistence, that the gospel takes time in our lives to work out um, the gospel, to work out change in our lives, and our job in that is to be in Christ, and I spent a lot of time talking about being in Christ I use this illustration of the uh, frosting. Um, If you take frosting and you put dye in the frosting and then mix it up, eventually you can't distinguish the difference between dye and frosting. It becomes becomes one. And that's what our job is, to be in Christ, is to become one. I also had another picture that was an illustration. It was a BMW that a deer had gone into. I'm not going to show that one. That picture was a little bit disturbing to some people, but... You could not distinguish the difference between the deer and the car in that picture. 
Um, so the idea is we are to be in Christ. But I also notice that, that in this, because of, um, because of being in Christ, and that's where, our, that's where we have to start, um, and the, the value in the, and as much as God has pressed on that in my life, um, I have a precarious leaning in my theology. So um, the, the gospel is often contrasted with religion. And so in religion, religion is all about what you can do for God. And the gospel is all about what God has done for you. And I, I recognized um, when Steve called me to, to preach this, this sermon and gave me the topic, I recognized that there was this precarious leaning in my theology. And actually, um, Jerry Bridges shares it as well because um, he, he confesses it right in his book. And so I'm going to read this. I recognized this as I was studying for this sermon. That, uh, and my, my previous sermon, I think um, I, I didn't complete it. So we need to be in Christ. But it, it, I've got this precarious leaning. So here's what, what Bridges says. How foolish I was. I misconstrued dependence on the Holy Spirit to mean that I was to make no effort, that I had no responsibility. I mistakenly thought if I turned it all over to the Lord, he would make my choices for me and would choose obedience over disobedience. All I needed was to look to him for holiness. But this is not God's way. He makes provision for our holiness, but he gives us the responsibility of using those provisions. So I want to complete my earlier sermon. So my earlier sermon was gospel transformation. What difference is the gospel making? And now tonight is part two of that. And it's also in the Pursuit of Holiness series here. It's our declaration of independence and dependence. So in this, we need this declaration of independence, but we also need this declaration of dependence. So we're going to use uh, Romans 8 here to, uh, to lead us through this. Romans 8, 1 through 17. Steve preached last week um, Romans 1 through 6, um, and I'll be using Romans 8, and we're going to talk about this declaration of independence, our declaration of dependence, and then God has given us some provisions for our battle for holiness. And I'm going to talk about those, and then I'm also going to talk about our battle orders. It's important that we understand these, and it's important in this order. So we're going to start right away with uh, Romans 8, 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. So this is the declaration. This is what God did. God has declared us free from the condemnation of sin. God declares that. And it's dependent on one thing. It's dependent on our union with Christ. So like I talked about last time, we need to be in Christ in order for our sins to be taken care of. A good illustration of this is, is in marriage. So let's pretend that you uh, approach marriage and you are bankrupt. You're up to your earlobes in debt. You, you have no way of paying off that debt. And let's say that you marry the wealthiest person in the world. When you marry that person and you come in union with that person through marriage, everything that they have, you now have. So your debt... Your uh, social standing is all uh, changed by that union. And so just like that, it's our union with Christ that takes care of our sin. We are spiritually bankrupt without Jesus. We have no hope of paying for our sin on our own. We are bankrupt. And Jesus comes, and through our union with him, we are now free from the condemnation of sin. 
It is really important for us to start here with our union with Christ. Anything else, any other place that we start, ends up leading us towards religion, towards focusing on what we can do. And then it becomes about us and not about Christ. So this is, that's, what, that's what God did. Now, this is how God did it. God did it because through Christ Jesus and for what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So God did it through Christ Jesus. What the law or religion was powerless to do, I love this, because it was weakened by the flesh. What the law was powerless to do, God did. God did it. God took care of our justification, and he did it through Christ. That's how he did it. Hebrews talks about this, um, talks about the sacrifice of, of, of Jesus on the cross, and he, it talks about it and ties it to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, sins were always paid for by blood. Blood had to be shed for sin to be taken care of. And all of those Old Testament sacrifices, all of the rituals and things that went around the sacrifices um, for, the, for the children of Israel to take care of their sins, those were all prophetic words for what Jesus would do on the cross for us. So they were all a dim reflection of what Jesus would, would finally do in, in perfection for us. Why did God do it? God did it to set me free from the law of sin and death. He condemned sin and sinful man, and then he set us free from the law of sin and death. death. You are set free from the reign of sin. And it's so that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Through our union with Christ, as a result of that, we are now free from the reign of sin. Sin does not rule in your life. So again, we have to start with this union with Christ. We have to start there. That's where the gospel starts. We not only need, though, this declaration of independence, we need a declaration of dependence. So Roman 8, Romans 8 goes on and talks about this. Uh, I'm going to back up to verse 4 because it just ties in a little bit better. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not, do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. The question here is who is in control? Who's in control in your life? We have been freed from the condemnation of sin. But we, in, in, our, in that state, we grant control. And we either grant control to the, to the flesh, or we grant control to the spirit. So here's what happens if we grant control to the sinful nature. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. The mind of sinful man is death. That's where it leads. And people, it is a battle inside of us. It's a battle from the day we declare our independence from sin. The Declaration of Independence was, was enacted on July 4th. The battle for the, the, this country's independence continued from July 4th for six years through November 30th of um, 1782. Six years. We declare our independence. We celebrate our independence on July 4th. That's when our independence was, that when we said it was. But that's when the battle started. And that's what it's like in our spiritual lives. When we declare our independence from sin by our union with Christ, 
the battle starts, and the battle continues in us. This is an all-out war. And if we do not fight, this will win. The mind of sinful man is death. If you don't fight it, that's where you end up. If we just go along with it, the mind of sinful nature is what controls us. So are we controlled or are we granting control to the sinful nature? Or Or are we declaring our dependence on the spirit? You who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. If you grant control to the Spirit, this is what happens. Life and peace. And I love what Jesus says in in John 17, 3 what eternal life is. He gives us the definition of eternal life. And I used to think that eternal life started once I died. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. When does eternal life start? It starts when you're introduced to Jesus. Our eternal life starts now. We know Jesus. We are united with him. We need to live in alignment with him and let our, let our eternal life start now. So we aren't waiting. There's certainly more glory to come. That's true. But there is a life now that we can follow Jesus, be transformed and become more and more like him. Back to Romans 8. Our declaration of dependence on the spirit you however are controlled not by the sinful nature but by the spirit if the spirit of god lives in you and if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he does not belong to christ but if christ is in you your body is dead because of sin yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness if you are in union with christ sin does not have reign over you Your body is dead. Your sinful nature is dead. It may feel that you have no hope. It may feel, you may feel as if you have no choice in it. But the truth is, the truth is that the body of the sinful nature is dead. Paul makes it clear, your body is dead because of sin. And it may not always behave as if it's dead, but it is dead. That your spirit is alive because of righteousness. So we need this declaration of independence. We're free from the reign of sin. We need this declaration of dependence on the spirit who is now in charge. The spirit is in charge. Your sinful nature is not in charge. So now we also need to know our provisions. And we need to know our orders. It's important to know what our role is in this battle. But before we, before we know our orders, I want to talk about our provisions. What have we been given in this battle for our holiness? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Our provisions, our provisions are powered by by the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's amazing, people. It's amazing. It's a miracle for someone to be dead and then to be alive. That's amazing, right? That's a lot of power. And that is the power that is in your life to help you battle sin. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. The God of the universe is working on your holiness. And if you, look at this, if you look at this passage, it actually describes here the triune God, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, he who raised Christ. The triune God is working on your behalf for your holiness. 
God is at work in your life. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's at work in your life to bring about your holiness. Bridges has a good quote on this. To experience practical, everyday holiness, we must accept the fact that God, in his infinite wisdom, has seen fit to allow this daily battle with indwelling sin. But God does not leave us to do battle alone. Just as he delivered us from the overall reign of sin, so he has made ample provision for us to win the daily skirmishes against skin, sin. <clears throat> the Christian should never complain, uh, complain of want of ability and power. If we sin... It is because we choose to sin, not because we lack the ability to say no to temptation. So we have the declaration of independence, the declaration of dependence, and our provisions, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, is at work in our lives to bring about our holiness. Now we need to understand what our orders are, what our battle orders are. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So those, that's, our, that's our battle orders. Put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. As I just said, the triune God is at work in your life for your holiness. Are you? He's working on it. Are you? We have to exert ourselves in this battle. It's like Steve talks about. It's whack-a-mole. Whenever that sin pops up, you hit it again. You hit it again. It's a constant battle. This is the battle of our lives. It's a battle in my life when I seek my own glory or I worship things instead of the infinite God or I love myself or I love my things more than people or more than God. It's when I trust my own thoughts. It's a battle against idolatry. It's a battle against pride. And it's not just the sins that other people see. That's the tip of the iceberg. It's the sins that are beneath the sins that people see. We can dress ourselves up. We can make ourselves look pretty. That's moralism. That's not what God is going for. He wants us to be transformed. And in my life, the more I've walked with Jesus, the more he peels back the layers of sin in my life. And I see, I see uh, anger, and I ask myself, why am I angry? And the more I peel that back, I'm, I'm angry because I'm not getting my way. Why am I so selfish? And I get down and I find pride. There's so much pride in my life and God keeps ripping away the layers and I see this. That's the, that's the iceberg. And he wants to take care of that sin. Not just anger on the surface. He wants to take care of my pride. He wants to root that out. And the triune God is working in my life to get rid of pride. I need to work with him, in line with him, by the Spirit, putting to death the misdeeds of the body. That's the battle in my life. Bridges says, it's clear from this passage that God puts responsibility for living a holy life squarely on us. We are to do something. We are not, are not to stop trying and start trusting. We are to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Over and over again in the epistles, not only in Paul's, but also other apostles as well, we are commanded to, to assume our responsibility for a holy walk. Paul exhorted, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is something that we are told to do. Bridges goes on to explain in his book, this, uh, there's a power in words. And the, the way I'd like to illustrate this is um, when my kids were, were younger and they wouldn't, they'd have trouble going to sleep, um, they'd, come out, they'd come out of their bedroom and they'd say, Dad, I can't sleep. 
And I would always take them back into their room, and I'd say, okay, lay down. They'd lay down, and I'd say, okay, say dad, and they'd roll their eyes like, oh, boy, here we go again. I'd say, say dad, and they'd say dad. I'd say, I'm going to sleep now. I'm going to sleep now. And then 15, 20 minutes later, they were asleep. I'm not saying they're magical words, but the way we communicate about our sin and about our struggle does influence how we respond. And Bridges talks about this, and he contrasts obedience versus victory. And this was, this was a big challenge for me, so I'm just going to let his words speak here. It's time for us Christians to face up to our responsibility for our holiness. Too often we say we are defeated by this or that sin. No, no. We are not defeated. We are simply disobedient. It might be good if we stopped using the terms victory and defeat to describe our progress in holiness. Rather, we should use the terms obedience and disobedience. When I say I'm defeated by some sin, I am unconsciously slipping out from under under my responsibility. I am saying something outside of me has defeated me. But when I say I am disobedient, that places the responsibility for my sin squarely on me. We may in fact be defeated, but the reason we are defeated is because we have chosen to disobey We have chosen to entertain lustful thoughts or to harbor resentment or to shade the truth. When Steve asked me to preach this sermon and I read that, I was was slain. Because um, too often I have been lazy. And I have said, God, let let your gospel take over. I can't work on this. If I work on this, then this is religion. But God has given us responsibility. Through the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. So this was a challenge for me. I'm preaching to myself here. And I need to get up and repent of my laziness and obey what God has asked me to do. But the beautiful thing here is that it's not some cold obedience. This is obedience, but it's not to just a new master. Romans 8 continues on, and this is, this is awesome. And if, by the way, you were thinking up to this point, this sounds a lot like works, that I've got to work this out. Remember, our justification is taken care of. Our sanctification, our pursuit of holiness, is something that we engage in the battle, in alignment with the Spirit, to battle the misdeeds of the body, to battle the sinful nature that is constantly at war in us. So we're called to obedience. Now let's see what kind of obedience. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The ESV translation of this verse actually uses the term adoption. We are called to an obedience, but it is not an obedience to a slave driver. It is obedience to a new father. God has adopted you. Through our union with Christ, we are now God's children. And he asks us to obey him, not to earn his favor, not to earn our justification. God cannot love us any less. He he will not, and he can't love us anymore. He has adopted us. And to illustrate this, I have adoption in my own life. So 
My children, both of my boys, Karsten and Kyle, were both adopted. And adoption is an amazing thing. And I love the, the, the word picture that adoption has served in my life for the gospel and for God's transformation of us. In the state of Minnesota, when someone is adopted, they pull the birth certificate, the original birth certificate, they put it in sealed records. They reissue the birth certificate with my name and my wife's name on it. They change history through adoption. That is what God has done for us. He has changed our history. He has adopted us. And it's amazing, too, when you think about it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were shaking our fist at God, He adopts us. That's amazing. He changes our history. The other thing is, it's permanent. And much to my my children's dismay, it's permanent. They can't get away from me. I am their father. They are my children. And it's unconditional. They're my children. I love them. I love them. And always will. And they will always, will, always will be my children. They're legal heirs. They are just like as if they were born from me. And the other thing that's a little bit troubling to them is that they become like me. Some people have actually argued with me when I've said, yeah, this is Karsten. And I've told them, well, um, they, they, they look at me and they say, that's, he looks just like you. And I said, well, that's amazing because he's adopted. No, he's not. He's not adopted. And I was like, I, he's my, I, I, I adopted him. I know this. Don't argue with me. But they, they actually, when you live long enough with someone, you kind of start to look like them. So they start, they kind of look like me. They kind of start to behave like me. They use my same mannerisms. They use things that I say, words that I say. It's kind of scary. So Bridges talks about this, and he says, Holiness is not a series of do's and don'ts, but a conformity to the character of God and obedience to the will of God. Accepting with contentment whatever circumstances God allows for me is very much a part of a holy walk. It's not a series of do's and don'ts. Religion uh, and the Pharisees um, in Jesus' day and religion in our day stacks up a list of things. If you do these things, you aren't a Christian. But if you do these things, you are a Christian. And the truth is, that's way too easy. God is looking for obedience, conformance to his character. It's not that easy. He's trying to root those things out and actually change us from sin to holiness. That's what he wants. He wants conformance with his character. So our orders are clear. We are to kill sin. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Steve's going to talk next week about some uh, practical habits that we can develop in our pursuit of holiness. But one thing that uh, Bridges offers for us in his book, um, he talks about two practical items in this um, obedience versus victory. He talks about a humble and consistent intake of Scripture and for us to be praying for holiness. So this quote here kind of illustrates that. Here then is another distinction we must make between what God does and what we must do. If the Holy Spirit uses Scripture to show us our need and to stimulate a desire for holiness, then doesn't it follow that we must be in God's Word on a consistent basis? Should we not go to the Word, whether to hear it preached or to do our own study, with the prayer to, that the Holy Spirit would search our hearts for any sin in us? A 
humble and consistent intake of Scripture and our prayer for holiness. So before I get to the final application, um, if there, I, I'm willing to take some questions now, if you guys have some questions about this Romans 8 passage. Um, I, I know that's something you guys do here on uh, Sunday night, so um, if there's any questions, be open to take those. Must have nailed it. All right. Well, then I'll invite the worship team back up, and uh, we'll we'll uh, proceed here. So, in the gospel application and the final application of this, I want to ask some questions. Have you been adopted? When we bend our knee to Jesus, and it's not just bending your knee once, it's a continual bending of your knee to Jesus, saying, Jesus, you will be my God. I will not be my God anymore. You will be my God. We are adopted. So if you're not adopted yet, you can do that tonight. You can turn to Jesus and say, the sin and my idolatry, God, I'm turning from it, and I'm turning to you now. I want you to be my God. And you will be adopted. And you will be declared free from the power of sin. But be warned, the battle starts then. From that declaration of independence, you need then also to be dependent. So the other question here is, are you fighting alone? Have you forgotten the spirit in your battle? Or are you aligned with the spirit? Have you forgotten your provisions? That the infinite God of the universe is at work in your holiness. And you need to align with that. And are you following your orders to kill sin? 